Okay, LSTM networks. This stands for Long Short Term Memory Network. They're a special kind of RNN, which stands for Recurrent Neural Network. But don't worry if you're not familiar with these, since this video doesn't require background on them. This video is going to start super high level, and then we're going to get more detailed and actually go into more depth on this diagram as the video goes on. So LSTMs are used to make predictions on sequence-based data. This might be a sentence, and we want to predict the next word in the sentence, kind of like an autocomplete model. Or we might pass in stock prices, we might pass in a bunch of stock prices from different days, and we want to predict a future price. The transformer neural network, which I have a whole playlist on, and it should pop up somewhere in the top right in a second, is actually used more commonly these days. However, LSTMs, these neural networks over here, they're definitely still worth learning for a few reasons. One, they're actually still used in products like Google Translate, so they're not entirely obsolete. The head researcher at OpenAI, Ilya, actually said that he thinks RNNs could make a comeback. And last, understanding the issues with LSTMs, they're not perfect, help us actually understand why the transformer neural network over here was originally developed. By the way, if you're already familiar with the general idea of an RNN, you can skip to the timestamp in the description. Okay, so let's start pretty high level. Let's say we're building a model that is kind of like autocomplete. We want to predict the next word in some sort of sequence, aka a sentence. So let's say we have, I grew up in France, I speak fluent, and then the model is supposed to predict what word comes next. We know that the word French should come next, but we want the model to actually be able to do this. So let's start over here. We're passing in some sort of input, X, into the model. And X is simply going to be our sequence, our sequence of words that we have so far. So this entire sequence over there. And then we get some sort of output. We get some sort of output, and we actually go ahead and pass something else, which we can see over here, back into the model. So back into the model over here, and then we have our sequence continuing again. When we actually unfold this, what we actually see is we have the initial time step. So we'll think of each token or each word in our sentence as some sort of time step. So maybe this is t equals zero, maybe the first token or word is t equals zero, and the next one is t equals one, and so on. So let's say we pass in i over here, the word i, and then the word grew over here, and so on. And the ultimate goal is to actually grab the next word in the sentence. So when we pass in the word i over here, the model is actually outputting some sort of information in the form of a vector that will actually be used in the next time step. So then when we pass in GRU over here, the model is actually factoring in both I and GRU to ultimately make its prediction for the next word in the sentence, which we know is up. So the fundamental idea here is that the model can factor in the previous information to actually make a future prediction. The model can actually factor in words for all the way from the past rather than only the previous word, only the previous word that came in the sentence. For now, let's not really worry about all these symbols like V and H, and now let's go back to the general idea of an LSTM. So let's say that between those two sentences, we have a bunch of irrelevant information that isn't relevant for the model predicting which word should come over here. We would actually say that the model needs to remember some information that was far into the past, and the model needs to actually factor that in to its response over here. That's where LSTMs come in. Now that we have a high level understanding of LSTMs, let's dive into these weird looking symbols and break down how they work. So the fundamental difference between a normal RNN and an LSTM is actually just what's going on inside this box over here. The general idea of passing information from our previous time steps, getting some sort of output, which we can see over here and over here, passing those in to the later time steps, where we also factor in whatever word is at our current time step, and simply continuing this, simply continuing this for further time steps until we get the output we're interested in. This fundamental idea remains the same. One of the core concepts behind LSTMs is this black line over here called the cell state. It actually runs through all the time steps, and the core idea going on inside this LSTM is simply to update all these operations that we see going on over here, as well as to the right, 
they're actually involved with updating or modifying that cell state. So let's look at the first gate that we have in the network right over here. If we actually scroll down, we can see that what's actually going on is we concatenate xt, the word at our current time step, and this vector ht minus 1, the vector that came from the previous time step. The concatenated vector is then passed into a single linear layer, so that's just a standard neural network. Remember, each of these nodes, if you're not familiar with neural networks, that's all right, but as a quick review, we're essentially passing in some sort of vector as the input. So we can think of a number. We can think of a number being stored in each of these nodes over here. So this is x1, this is x2, and this is x3. We can think of this as a vector with three entries. And then what's going on in each of these hidden nodes is actually linear regression. Y1 through Y4 is calculated for each of those nodes, where each of the Ys is actually calculated based on this equation. So for each of those nodes, the X1, X2, and X3 from the input layer are used, and each of those nodes actually learns over the process of training the LSTM a separate W1, W2, W3, and B or bias. Then each of those entries, Y1 through Y4, are actually passed into this sigmoid function over here, which always outputs a number between 0 and 1. So ultimately, after this layer over here, or this gate over here, symbolized by the sigmoid or Greek sigma letter over here, we have a vector of entries where each entry is between 0 and 1. Conceptually, whatever vector was actually calculated and is outputted over here is actually factoring in the current word over here as well as whatever vector came in from the previous time step. And we're going to use that to then update the cell state. The way we update the cell state, symbolized by this x, which is essentially represented by this equation. We take the element-wise multiplication of the previous cell state vector and our sigmoid output. So if we're actually having entries between 0 and 1 in this vector over here, then we can think of that as essentially taking a fraction for each entry in the previous cell state vector. We are taking a fraction of it, since we're multiplying it by something between 0 and 1, and reflecting that in the updated cell vector. Just to make that super clear, we can see that if we multiply element-wise two vectors where one of the vectors has entries between 0 and 1, this is equivalent to keeping or preserving some fraction of the information. That means there's actually an intuitive explanation for what that sigmoid gate is doing. It's actually referred to as the forget gate. We know that some of the information in some sort of body of text is irrelevant for actually predicting the next word in the sentence. Going back to our example where we wanted to predict the word French. We know that we had a bunch of irrelevant information in between in that body of text, and the main thing that we wanted to remember from the past was the word France, that the speaker grew up in France. But some of the information in our current time step, in our current time step, and maybe even in the previous time step, needs to be forgotten by the neural network. So that's why we refer to this as the forget gate. If we're actually multiplying the previous information in the cell state by some sort of number that is between 0 and 1, then we are essentially forgetting some of that information and also preserving some of that information. The closer the sigmoid output is to 0, the more information we're actually forgetting. The closer that output is to 1, the more information we're actually remembering, since if we multiply something by 1, it doesn't change at all. We're preserving that previous information. And through the process of training the LSTM, the right parameters are actually learned for each of these nodes, so this top node as well as the three below it, to actually learn to forget and preserve the right information from xt and ht minus 1. The other gates, which are actually to the right of the first gate, work in a very similar way. We also need to figure out what information to add to the cell state after we figured out what information to forget and what information to preserve. And our final gate, which can actually be seen over here, simply helps us determine what information we should output. In the interest of keeping this video concise, let's quickly explain how this gate works. There's two steps to actually updating and adding information into our cell state, adding in the new information. 
the first step is remembering or actually figuring out what information we want to add. That's what this tan age gate does. And the next step is figuring out how much of that new information we ultimately want to add. The sigmoid gate over here works the exact same as the previous sigmoid gate. If we just scroll down, we see that we just concatenate xt and ht minus 1. We have a linear layer, although we should note that this linear layer that is used in this gate, the new sigmoid gate we're talking about, has a separate set of weights that are learned for each of our nodes y1 through y4. And we follow that up with a sigmoid function, which we can see over here. The tanh gate over here works extremely similarly. We're going to have a linear layer, and we're going to have nodes in the hidden layer that are actually learning weights based on the xt and the ht minus 1 that are passed in. However, we follow up the output of the linear layer with a tan h activation, which actually has outputs between negative 1 and 1 instead of 0 and 1, as in the sigmoid function. This should make sense since the tan h gate is actually supposed to calculate what information we want to ultimately add in to our cell state, what new information is relevant for the model to remember, while the sigmoid gate, this sigmoid gate, figures out okay, how much of that information is ultimately relevant to add in to our cell state. So before we actually add the information into the cell state, we simply need to multiply that information together since we know that multiplying vectors together where one vector has entries between 0 and 1 actually helps us decide how much of our second vector should actually be preserved. All that's left to figure out is how we calculate HT the output of this time step, which is also used in the next time steps for get gate over here. Figuring out what actually needs to be outputted for this time step, we know that we should probably draw that information from our updated cell state after the forget gate has done some calculations and our addition gate has done some calculations. We know that the updated value of the cell state at this point should actually be factoring in our previous information and our current word, our current word at this time step. And not only has it factored that information in, but over here it's actually discarded what's irrelevant, and here it's added in what is relevant. That's exactly what the LSTM does. It actually passes in the cell state into a tan H gate over here, a tan H gate, and then we actually just element wise, element wise multiply that with the output of yet another sigmoid gate. For this neural network layer is factoring in the current value of the cell state, which we might think of as symbolized as CT. And this neural network layer over here, the sigmoid layer, is factoring in XT and HT minus one as usual. As usual, the element-wise multiplication helps us figure out how much of that information that came from the cell state is actually relevant to preserve and ultimately pass on as our output over here and over here. The fact that the sigmoid output over here is between 0 and 1 is what helps us achieve that. So that's the overview of LSTMs, but there's still some clarifications we need to make. LSTMs aren't perfect and they have issues. The primary issue is we cannot take advantage of parallel processing as much as we would like to with modern GPUs. We need the outputs from previous time steps during training to actually calculate our future time steps. That means we're actually limited by the sequence length, and the longer the sequence length, the longer training will take. Transformers, on the other hand, actually process all tokens, so tokens are essentially words at different time steps, in parallel. Next, it may be unclear, based on the, the concept overview we just gave, as to how to actually implement an LSTM and train it. We know there's going to be a lot of matrix multiplications, a lot of sigmoid functions, a lot of tanh functions. If you're interested in a video on implementing an LSTM, definitely leave a comment. Lastly, learning requires practice. That's why I've created a bunch of coding problems and quizzes which should be popping up on the screen soon. They're all free on my website. Every practice problem has a video associated with it in the playlist that's about to pop up. So definitely check it out and hopefully I'll see you soon.